All right, Chris, the floor is yours. All right, well, thanks a lot for asking to have me and happy to be back and talk to you guys. Last time I was up there, I spoke about um, rat snakes uh, uh, as part of the taxonomy that was most common at the time um, up along the East Coast. And that has since earlier this year changed. And I'm sure we'll see some more changes coming with all that in the future because it seems to be an ever evolving situation. Um, <clears throat> that first picture I just put, because it's one of my favorite pictures of a bunch of my snakes of what used to be the obsolete complex of rat snakes. Uh, there's rat snakes there from the Appalachian Mountains down to the Keys um, on the eastern seaboard of, uh, well, a little bit into the Gulf uh, panhandle of, of Florida, but still uh, showing the diversity of what was subspecies. Um, now, let's see if I look at that group there, that group actually at the moment, based on locality of each one of those five there would actually be considered all one species by some folks and split between two by other folks. So uh, I tend to, which we'll go over and farther through this, uh, tend to stay a little bit more old school um, with some of my taxonomy changes, but not entirely because it seems to be a little bit more understandable for some folks. So um, you can switch the screen. Um, I was asked to kind of go over North American rat snakes, which are, are my favorite in general. Uh, so we're talking about species from ranging from Canada down through Mexico. Um, at the moment, we have four genuses that cover um, rat snakes throughout um, these three countries. Uh, Pantherophis being the largest of these groups uh, that can kind of consist of several species or not several species, depending on your take on the taxonomy. Um, Bogotophis, uh, those are the subox and the rosy rats of the Baja Peninsula. Centicolis, which are your green rats, they range just barely into uh, southern U.S. Uh, range down into Mex Mexico and in, in well into Central America. Um, really cool group of, of, of rat snakes. I have not worked with them personally. My partner that I work with has worked with some of them, but uh, I, I have not had a chance in my environment. It's not, uh, my, my herping setup is not uh, the, the best for keeping some of those species at the moment, so I haven't gone down that road. Uh, pseudo elafe um, are your night snakes. Some people call them red yellow rat snakes. It's a whole group of, of snakes that range from Mexico down through Central America. Um, uh, one species at least that I'm aware of, unless that's been broken up into multiple species, I'm not sure at the moment, but uh, another one I haven't gotten into, just they're a little bit more tropical and uh, I've got a couple of friends working with them, but I haven't really branched into that because my passion tends to be more um, of the species and localities that are within uh, Pantherophis at the moment, which used to be Alafe um, years ago. So um, not too many genuses here within our country um, at the moment. There's a lot more genuses and constantly new genuses when you get into some of the old world, particularly in Asia. That is a very budding environment for uh, taxonomy change as they're getting in there and doing a lot more research um, in those countries down there. So. Uh, next slide. Some of this is what I just kind of talked about with those is uh, you've got some of these guys that are more Central American, uh, like the Centicolis and Pseudolafe, um, with Centicolis just ranging into, into Southern Arizona and supposedly a little bit into New Mexico. Um, Pseudolafe doesn't come all the way up into the U.S. and just staying in Mexico down through Central America. Um, Bogotophis, which a lot of people really love, a really, really cruel group of snakes. Um, your your Transpecos or Subox, as most, most of us call them. Um, rosy rat, uh, the Rosies, uh, the Bajas from um, that little peninsula down there below California are a really cool group, group of snakes. They're very uncommonly kept and bred um, in captivity. They've had some uh, notorious challenges with husbandry over the years. Some folks have got it kind of t dialed in real well, but uh, they are pretty hard to find, but uh, the subox, the transpecos are pretty commonly bred these days with various morphs. Um, 
one of the morphs is a naturally occurring uh, morph um, in a particular area of Texas, which is the blonde phase. Um, there'll be some pictures of those uh, shortly. But uh, really cool group of snake, very different than others. I don't currently work with them. My partner does. I stopped keeping them here because my, uh, my humidity uh, offerings uh, in, in my room uh, are not ideal here in Alabama, the way I set my stuff up, particularly during the summer times. And uh, they don't tend to thrive for me. So I left him to keep um, the groups that we were working with. And I tend to stick with some of the ones that can tolerate a little bit more humidity um, than those dry desert Western species. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Here's a good example of a couple of normal patterned uh, transpacos or subox. Uh, this particular group um, are the normal pattern ones from uh, the Turlingua vicinity of Texas, uh, where the natural occurring blondes uh, come from. Uh, these guys are really, really different animals to work with than you know what what you guys have up there is the, the, the black rats, or eastern rats, whatever you want to call them, and or the yellows or any of the grays, that sort of thing. They're they're a very different animal. They got separated off from Alapa years and years ago. Um, and uh, they're really, really cool animals to work with and unique animals to work with. They've got some very, very distinct habits and uh, um, just personalities and stuff to them that are unique. And one of the cool things about them is they actually have a tick that is named after them um, that is only found attached to their tails um, in the wild. Uh, so and there's a bunch of research done on them. It's the only thing that they've ever found them on. So it's a pretty cool, uh, uh, evolution of, of, of host situations from, from down there in Texas um, and in the northern Mexico with these guys. So it's a, got, a, got a lot of interesting stuff going on with, with, that, with that group of snakes. So um, next slide. Here's an example of a blonde uh, with a sibling normal. Um, again, these are from the Terlingua vicinity of uh, the range for these guys. Uh, the genetics and the research has shown that this blonde um, is literally some mutation where just the striping doesn't exist. And um, this, despite that pattern looking quite different and not having the saddles that you see with the, with the normal phase one, um, apparently, uh, particularly there'll be a book shown here shortly. The guy that wrote that book has done a lot of research on these guys. Um, that it's just a, a simple lack of the stripe and you get this, this more circular donut um, sort of pattern left on these guys. And uh, they're really cool. And you can actually see animals like this, uh, in, come across the animals like this in the wild in a particular part of the range. Uh, it just has to do with uh, 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 the, the type of soil and stuff in the area that allowed this, this particular mutation to uh, persist in that area. And they tend to be really nice and light mustardy colored like this. So. Pretty, pretty cool animals uh, to, to get to work with. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> All right, this group is my favorite group to work with. Uh, what I grew up seeing around, what you guys have up by you. Um, there's just lots of controversy within this group at the moment. Um, and uh, here, it's just a constant battle of what people should call things um, based off of a couple sets of, of research start, you know, coming into publication in about 99, 2000 range, more showed up uh, this year, uh, or an early part of the year, uh, kind of partially debunking some of what was published before by Burbrink. Um, and it gets to the point where we had one species, multiple subspecies, then we had three species. Now we have maybe two species. Um, at least within the obsoleta complex, the, the uh, Gutata complex, the, the red rat, emery rat group. Um, that was broken up a number of years ago um, from one species of multiple subspecies. Uh, then they did it with the same guy that did the other obsoleta one. Um, he did one, he did some papers and broke it up into three species sinking some of the subspecies that were previously um, acknowledged. And uh, now the paper, another paper came out this year, earlier this year, that 
broke it into two species with one of them having two subspecies. And well, I've got some charts, uh, some pictures kind of going over some of that shortly. Um, the only one that seems to be being left alone at the moment um, is Baradai, the, the Baird's rat, or some people call them metallic rats um, from the Texas into Northern Mexico range. Um, once they got broke off from Alafe years ago, um, they seem to have been left alone for the moment. Um, it has been shown and documented that in the wild, in a particular part of the range, um, that these guys do actually interbreed some uh, with some of the old obsoleta complexes, the Texas rats or Western rats, whatever you care to call them these days. Um, there have been several accounts of those guys being uh, na found naturally uh, in, as an integrate between the two, which kind of debunks the old species, subspecies line of what is what. Um, and so that's where some of the headache comes in these days is people are breaking these up and saying these are species and those are no longer subspecies, but yet they're still finding integrates, which the old uh, definitions kind of made distinctions as far as how things can be species. So it's, it's, it's a big headache, but uh, at the moment, Baird is the one not being bothered with. I'm sure that'll change someday, unfortunately, but um, all right, next slide. This particular uh, slide is uh, an image of a map that Frank Burbrink put in his paper from 99, 2000 range when he did some rearranging of the obsoleta group primarily. And this actually, this particular map kind of, his point of showing it, this kind of breaks it up by phenotype of what we actually see as an animal. This isn't truly the old taxonomy, but it goes to being more what we see where gray rats are just found in the upper Gulf Coast region. Yellow rats are peninsular Florida going up the East Coast. You've got black rats ranging in the whole upper part. You've got the Texas rats coming out of Texas. And phenotypically, the animals that range up my way and uh, Mississippi and stuff like that actually tend to match the the Texas rat, Lindheimeri subspecies uh, phenotype, more so than the gray rats found closer to the coast. So um, a lot of folks tend to like to name and identify animals by their look and within that range of how these different phenotypes um, exist in the varying parts of the range. And so most, a lot of folks like this and find it to be a more user-friendly approach to identifying snakes, but all the DNA work that's been done over the past 20 plus years is saying that evolutionarily post pre-ice age that this is not the case. So that's where a lot of the headache comes in with trying to label and identify a lot of our rat snakes um, in, in the Eastern half of the US. We don't have any native ones really out West in the true West like California and stuff other than just the ones that peak up from Mexico. So. Uh, next slide. This is the published paper picture of uh, Frank, Frank Burbank's uh, range maps, breaking up what was uh, Alafe obsoleta or Pantherophus obsoletus into three separate species. Uh, it kind of was not really paid a whole lot of attention to until the new Peterson's field guy came out a handful of years ago and used this, which this is actually a picture out of that book, ultimately the same map um, showing the three distinct um, ranges of the three species. Um, one of the big problems with is a lot of folks had issue with his sampling and the fact that he's got a huge area there on the right side. Um, in that more maroony color, that was an area of uncertainty, which is, you know, up where you guys are, and so a lot of people kind of had issue with that. And um, some some states, like uh, as far as their conservation goes, as far as protecting species, if they're in a part of the, you know, if that's the way their state does things, um, some of the states adopted some of this. Some of the states kept with the old taxonomy, and that made it makes it also difficult, is because some states 
recognize um, different taxonomy um, for some of the same animals. So it makes it really complicated. So some folks, because of this publication, um, they, they go with the Eastern rat, the Midland rat, um, and the Western rat and use those taxonomies. I, I, I don't go with it. I'm not going to dispute his research. Um, I know enough people that uh, are in the academic end and can evaluate it and aren't real crazy about it. And the new paperwork that came paper that came out this year, um, uh, it, I'll show you shortly. It says that they're not crazy about this either. Uh, I am not academically trained enough to argue it. Um, Frank Berberink is much more uh, astute at. Uh, being able to publish a paper like this that I can't argue with because I don't understand all of the DNA based um, rearrangements that uh, that he put forth on this or the new paper that came out. So, um, but this is just an example of, of where we have gone uh, to over the past 20 years, but really most specifically the past five to seven years since that book was published. Um, all right, next slide. This, uh, <clears throat> this was published this year. Uh, this map shows a slightly different rearrangement, basically saying the um, yellow rats, which were sunk and just absorbed into the Alleghenyensis of the East Coast, um, get full species status of quadrupedatus, which is the old subspecies for yellow rats, and saying that they range coastally up the East Coast, up into North Carolina, where you see the striped phasing going up along there. Uh, a lot of the Alleghenyensis and Spiloides kind of got merged together um, and got called Alleghenyensis because the, uh, the, the name uh, predated the other and um, kind of leaving it to where there's just an integrated zone between Alleghenyensis and Quadrupedatus um, along that kind of Eastern seaboard as the um, landscape geography changes coastally up to the mountains and the Appalachians you, you have a, a gradual integration of the two species, um, according to this, this paper that came out. Um, the barrier to the Western rat uh, is roughly the Mississippi. The Mississippi has changed course varyingly um, over the millennia. And so sometimes you get DNA results of one to the other. Um, on either side, and that'll show as well with the, the fox snake shortly as well as where what's done with that. So as of this year, yellow rats are now considered a full species. Uh, blacks and grays are kind of lumped together, um, at least in portion of the range as one species. And then the Texas and the Western blacks are their own group out there with the beards being kind of left alone down there to the bottom. So. Um, Again, that's uh, a constant, constant frustration with folks that have an interest in this in this group, and I don't foresee this being fixed anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, next slide. Here we go. Uh, fox snakes are a really, really cool group of of rat snakes. A uh, little bit bull snakeish in 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 structure with the keel scales, and uh, their habits are uh, a little bit more terrestrial than some of the the obsoleta forms. Uh, they have been known to actually been found as wild hybrids with bull snakes in the western end of the range. But here you see um, what was defined in the past as either one species with two subspecies or two separate species was the last one. Um, when it was a laffe, there was one species of vulpina with gloidae and vulpina as being the two subspecies between an eastern and a western uh, races where the divide there, there's a, there's a habitat gap there um, in Ohio and uh, Indiana and Michigan there. Uh, the new taxonomy since some DNA work was done and we'll see that on the next slide, you can change it. The next slide showed that we have now lumped up, we have supposedly sunken gloidae, which are the, the former subspecies or species found around the Great Lakes and lump those into the ones from Indiana, Illinois, uh, and Wisconsin principally um, found east of the Mississippi River. Uh, and then you just have Westerns found 
west of the Mississippi River with some varying uh, population identities um, along the Mississippi having to do with the changes of the Mississippi River's flow um, over the years. Uh, there's some isolated uh, genetics on either side of the other side um, along the way. So several of the states, and I've even talked to DNRs trying to find out the legality of somebody wanting to get a baby of mine, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of the states, particularly around the old Gloidae race range of Ohio and Michigan and Ontario, they have not, um, at least the last I checked, I haven't really paid attention the past maybe year, year and a half, but uh, they consider, they still consider Gloidae to be a legitimate species around, the, around Lake Erie um, and haven't really jumped on board with calling them Fulpinus. Um, so, and some of that goes into being able to protect certain populations. In Michigan, you have two ranges of, of fox snakes. You have the ones along the lakes on the eastern side, and then you have a couple counties up in the upper peninsula uh, of what was western fox snakes, now eastern fox snakes. And uh, those don't receive the same uh, protection in the wild um, as the eastern uh, range stuff does. And so a lot of that goes to what I was saying with a lot of these states, certain states have accepted this new taxonomy and others haven't um, for varying reasons, um, right, wrong, and different. It's just what is done at this time. So um, the Western species um, west of the Mississippi was given a new, although I'm pretty sure it was old, I can't remember, I haven't read the paper in quite a while, of the species name of Ramspotii. Uh, and some, and, and that goes into some of the, the laws and stuff where that's a separate species and the people east of there don't protect it. So it's, it's kind of a confusing thing where different states protect, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Missouri um, says that they have two separate species of fox snakes within their state. There's a little small population of, of Easterns that cross the river in Northeast Missouri and then extreme Western Missouri up in the Northwest corner. There's a little small pocket of uh, Western foxes that range down just up into a couple of county areas up in there. So um, Missouri protects both their fox snakes uh, in uh, both species of fox snakes, even though historically there's only been one fox snake there. So um, a bit of a confusing situation, unfortunately, but uh, it seems to be the state uh, of, of things at the moment. So, all right, next slide. All right, here, <clears throat> historically years ago uh, with our, our, our red rat snake group, which was Elafe guttata years ago. Um, and we had multiple subspecies within that uh, species. Uh, we had <clears throat> Emery's rats. We had Intermontano rats up in uh, Colorado and Utah. We had uh, Melamorum in South Texas and Northern Mexico. We had rosy rats, uh, Rosica in uh, the Keys. Um, and then we had Guttata in the Eastern half of the US, like east of the Mississippi River. Uh, Burbrink had published some papers. I couldn't find the map for that. Um, uh, <clears throat> back in the vicinity of when he did the obsolete stuff that had um, upgraded an integrated range of, of rat snakes uh, in East Texas, Western Louisiana, a little bit uh, up above into Arkansas and stuff like that. He had upgraded that to Slewinski eye um, and had sunk Melamorum, had sunk uh, Intermontana, uh, Rosy rats uh, were sunk as well. Uh, DNA was done a number of years ago on those keys animals and found that they were no different genetically than the mainland stock. So that is what it is. Uh, this year, this paper came out by the same folks, I think, at least it came from the same source uh, that had upgraded the yellow rats um, to a full species status um, and had downgraded Slowinski eye to a subspecies of emery eye. Uh, resurrecting the thorn scrub rat, the Melamorum, um, in South Texas, Northern Mexico, uh, not recognizing the Intermontana and in the few counties of Utah and Colorado uh, in the western slopes of the, the Rockies as being anything distinct than the, the northern the northern central plains emery rats. Um, so it puts us back as having two species now, Gutatus and the 
the eastern part of the range, Emery Eye on the western part of the range with um, three subspecies technically um, uh, within that Emery Eye. Um, I think personally, when I saw this, I couldn't, I couldn't argue with it. Uh, I, I work with and breed Slewinski. Whether it's a full species or a subspecies, uh, I, I'm kind of good with either, but working with them, they're very much Emery rats in temperament and personality. Uh, they, they're totally chill one minute, you mess with them, bother them, and they get kind of spazzy and freak out just like a great, any Great Plains or, or Thorns Grove does. So uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't really uh, argue with that and feel that basically the Mississippi River kind of divides personalities. And you see some of the ones in, in Southeast Louisiana, um, just above the river there in those couple of parishes in adjacent Mississippi. And those animals look like a red rat snake. They act like a red rat snake across the river and get up into um, some of the, 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 the Kasachi National Forest vicinity and stuff like that. And you've got animals that act different. They, they, they're a big emery, a different color. Uh, they gradually fade in color as you go into Texas and, and, be, and become more of a light colored animal as the forests of the east disappear and turn into plains. Um, the, the phenotype changes. But uh, this is, at the moment, as of this year, the new taxonomy for this group. Um, haven't heard a whole lot of talk about it and where a lot of folks are standing on it, but, um, excuse me, that seems to be the, the new take for that group of Pantherophis at the moment. We'll see how long that lasts. So, uh, next slide. Hey, Chris, before we go on to the next slide, I wanna make sure mm -hmm. that Melissa Melissa and Nick had a question about sure. um, red, the red rat. Um, okay. And I want to make sure Melissa and Nick did did Chris's explanation um, answer your question, or do you need more um, information? Nick is good. Okay, so okay. that that was a good explanation. And um, Melissa, were you did did that make sense to you? She said that she'd been told that corn snakes are considered a subspecies of rat snake. The red rat snake is this accurate. Uh, you're talking about one thing, you're talking about two common names. So they're, they, they, they're, a red rat snake is a corn snake to some folks. Where I grew up in Florida, we didn't call them corn snakes. We called them red rat snakes. Um, other parts of the country, the common name was called corn snake. And so uh, in the pet trade, and and stuff like that, corn snake is more commonly used. Um, uh, corns, I think, were also, although, because I don't remember back then, I think were used as well, maybe over to the Great Plains races back in the day before the new taxonomy came along. But a red rat snake is a corn snake. It's just a matter of what you call them. Um, scientific name, Pantherophis cutatus at the moment for a red rat snake and a corn snake, technically the stuff farther west are called Great Plains rats or Thorn Scrub rats or Skolinski rats or uh, Kasachi corn sometimes. Um, they all used to be red rats and corn snakes. And so it's kind of a loaded question, but uh, red rat snakes are pretty much reserved this day to the populations east of the Mississippi. Um, so <clears throat> does that kind of answer your question? Yes, and she says, thank you for that explanation. And Nick says, he wants to make sure all of those are still rat snakes. Corn snakes are rat snakes. Absolutely, yes. They're in the genus Pantherophis. They are definitely rat snakes. All right, Nick, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, some folks like myself, because we are frustrated with the changes in taxonomy, uh, and apparently continuing to change. Uh, we've gone to labeling an animal and working with uh, genetic groups that are isolated to a small area. And we kind of blow off the taxonomy changes and just kind of sort of don't acknowledge it and just call them by what they look like and where they're from. Uh, examples of some of what I call some of the stock that I work with. I work with some yellow rats um, and they're from Seminole County, which to me is like the iconic classic look of a yellow rat snake that, you know, everybody grew up with knowing what a yellow rat snake looked like. And that's the county where I grew up. And uh, 
the yellow rat snakes down there along the St. John's River are just like iconically beautiful, classic looking straw animals, black stripes for the most part. And so instead of arguing whether it's an Eastern rat, a yellow rat, whatever, um, I just call them Seminole County yellow rats. Um, they're a yellow rat snake, visually, color-wise, it's a yellow rat snake. Um, and I label it for the county where it came from. Um, same with uh, like my fox snakes because of the taxonomy confusion and frustration. I just call my Western fox snakes. I call them Washington County, Nebraska fox snakes. Um, uh, I work with two different groups of uh, the white oak gray rat snakes. Um, one of the localities I work with all came from a small piece of property uh, in Santa Rosa County down, down uh, in the Western Panhandle. Uh, Deckert's rats. Um, I work with pure insular stock, stock that came off of Southern Key Largo many years ago. And uh, so instead of uh, having them lumped into other stock that has been uh, used from the Southern, uh, Southern mainland um, that look quite different, uh, despite the fact the original description for a Deckert's rat or Keys rat um, did include uh, part of the mainland as their range, the insular animals from the upper keys look distinctly different than the mainland stock. Um, I've even seen uh, a picture of a recent animal caught this past year that, um, that look exactly like mine and they were caught right in the same area where mine was caught. They're, they're rare in the wild these days. Uh, we've developed the keys so much that there's not a lot of habitat left. Um, so unfortunately they're, although they do still exist there, they're just harder to see. They don't, uh, they are not as common as the red rats or rosy rats from the Keys um, because they're a bigger animal and less food items to, uh, to, to be able to get. Whereas the rosy rats and stuff um, on average are a good bit smaller animal and uh, seem to be willing to partake in, in at least part of their lives some subsisting on uh, all the anoles and geckos and stuff that have been introduced um, down there in that part of the range. So um, same. Black rats are old range. I mean, you're talking about animals that were found from northern Louisiana all the way up into, you know, Massachusetts and everywhere else. Well, as of 2020, black rats had three different species. Um, so I just call my black rats by the county and the city that they came from in South Carolina, and I just leave it at that. You can call them whatever you want. They're always going to be a Spartanburg black rat, regardless of what somebody is currently calling you know, them taxonomically. It just uh, eliminates that, at least for me, and I keep my populations uh, pure for the locality. I try to get new stock from the same areas every, um, every so often when I, when I feel my, my group needs it. And so they can keep changing and rearranging the taxonomy they want. They're still the same snake from there as opposed to if I got a black rat from Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I've mixed it, bred it with a black rat from Little Rock, Arkansas, um, they're both phenotypically a black rat. They do look a little bit different between the two, um, but those are two different species and their loca localities are found really far apart from one another. And so I just stick doing locality stuff and they can keep rolling the dice and changing the names taxonomically uh, however they want. So um, next slide. Uh, seeing as Baird rats have been kind of left alone. I put a couple of pictures of some Baird rats in here just because once they were broken off, they were left by themselves and aren't as much of a, uh, a talking point uh, as, as some of the other ones. Uh, they do vary a little bit across the range. Some of the two populations down in Mexico um, look quite different than the ones found in Texas. Uh, but uh, they're a really cool group of rat snakes that have been shown to integrate uh, with the Texas rat, the obsolete form, Western rat, whatever you want to call it. Um, I do end up working with some. I don't keep any at the moment. Um, I did have my partner keeps keeps our, our group um, from the eastern part of the range in eastern Valverde County. Um, some of the nicer ones, cleaner, brighter colored ones, really cool. Uh, these are a couple babies that I uh, hatched out a few years ago. So uh, next slide. And here is uh, the grandfather. Yeah, the grandfather of those babies. Uh, who is uh, still around at the moment. Uh, he's original founder stock um, for our group and uh, really impressive fella. So really, really cool guy. Uh, again, some of those Western species just don't work too well for me here. 
And so I've, uh, I only keep them short term here and there, raising up some babies short term and, uh, and taking some extra stuff from him when he needs to thin out his group at the house. And so I'll have him here every once in a while, but I just don't set up a group um, anymore here. They just don't like my summers at all. So, all right, next up. Um, the Fox Snakes, we talked, touched on that a little while ago. This is a kind of extremely underrated and underappreciated group of, of rat snakes. Uh, their habits are a little bit more terrestrial, a little more aquatic, uh, like being in, in low countries around water, uh, not as broadly distributed as, as uh, their range suggests. They tend to follow rivers and lay, lay in the low uh, marshlands and prairies uh, in, in the lowland areas uh, within their range. Uh, the back in the mid 90s, early 90s, somewhere in there, uh, the stock in the eastern part of the range, the old eastern foxes, gloidae species or subspecies, uh, uh, got protected by Michigan, on Ontario, and, and Ohio. And uh, they were cheap snakes back in the day. People overlooked them, didn't pay attention to them. And uh, once they became protected uh, to the point where they didn't allow them to be collected in the field without uh, special permits. Uh, they kind of disappeared. And uh, fortunately, um, uh, a friend of mine was able to obtain a couple of animals uh, right around the year 2000 that were some old wild caught animals from Northern Ohio. And uh, we've been able to maintain um, a line of those uh, old stock um, to this date. I've got several of them just below my elbow here in some cages. Uh, in fact, that one that pictured is right by my knee. Um, they're the most classic, beautiful animals that people consider fox snakes to be, although I do feel that Wisconsin has some absolutely stunning animals as well. Um, but uh, it is very hard to find these guys. They're not the most reliable breeders. They produce small clutches of big eggs. And so uh, there's still not a lot of them around these days. Uh, unfortunately, that can be traced back to true wild caught animals from within that range and not been mixed out with stuff from Indiana, Illinois. Wisconsin, that sort of thing. So um, just an absolutely uh, stunning group of animals, some of the favorite stuff I work with. So uh, next slide. I, I work with a group um, from the extreme Western end of the range over in Washington County, Nebraska. Uh, I've got this, this, this locality uh, established um, finally and got some folks, other folks with them in hand. So with any luck, we will have this uh, these guys around for for the years to come, at least within uh, in, within the hobby, within herpticulture. Uh, so uh, that's one of my one of my girls there that that I really like. In fact, I just pulled her out with a couple of the others to to be cooled today. So hoping for some babies. I gave them a break this 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 year uh, while I was doing some rearranging with my rat snake housing and 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 neonate rearing. Uh, and gave a bunch of my rat snakes, including my foxes, my at least my western foxes, a break this year, uh, so I could have a little bit more time and space to work on some stuff. So I'm eager to get some babies from these guys again next year. So, but uh, pretty drastic difference between the extreme eastern part of the range and the far western part of the range as far as coloration, um, even size. Uh, the, the the western ones don't seem to get, at least within Nebraska, don't seem to get quite as 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 bulky and heavy as some of the eastern ones. Still get pretty good size. My girls are uh, four, four plus, um, but just don't seem to bulk up um, quite like some of the Eastern one uh, uh, localities do. Uh, they're still impressive beasts when you, when you have them out, but they don't get as big as well as some of the obsolete forms like the black rats and all that stuff. They're, they're a shorter animal, a little stockier uh, uh, with some very noticeable killed scales like you see in a lot of the Pituophis, bull snakes, pine snakes stuff like that they have a very coarse texture um, to their to their to the feel when you when you put them in your hand so uh relatively laid back group of animals too just uh real pleasure to work with so uh next slide here's an example of a uh, collage of pictures that i took of what all used to be within one species years ago under obsoleta or obsoletus under uh the common rat snake uh these were all different subspecies as Williams I, Spiloides, Obsoleta, Quadrivitata, Ross Allen I, Deckard I, uh, and Spiloides slash 
Lindheim or I, depending on your take on the rat snakes here in the middle of Alabama, those all represented, for the most part, different subspecies there, very different looking phenotypes. Um, in fact, there's even three rat snakes there, all found within peninsular Florida that are drastically different looking animals between the Keys and Central Florida. Um, so this goes into where that Burbrink paper that came out and grouped it up as they did um, based on his results, um, frustrated a lot of people because it just made it very difficult to help uh, non-herp folk for one thing, to be able to identify an animal um, that they find in their area because it's not a gray rat snake anymore, it's not a black rat snake, et cetera. Um, you can have an Eastern rat snake by that taxonomy that was black, that was yellow stripe, that was gray stripe, that was gray patterned, everything in between. So um, that's just an example of, of a variety of, of yellows, Deckerts, Everglades, grays, blacks, Gulf hammocks, uh, all there kind of mixed in, uh, in one little collage of pictures that of some of my guys. So next slide. All right, we're going to touch on some of the uh, red rat, gutata, gutatus uh, race, that, that complex of red rat, corn snakes, emery rat group. Um, these are red rat snakes. These come from the foothills of North Carolina up in Cleveland County. Uh, tend to call them the South Mountain red rats. Uh, they don't look anything like the red rats that you see uh, even in the sand hills of the Carolinas, or especially dot down towards the coast, um, like you know your classic uh, red rat snakes from the Okatee Hunt Club in Jasper County. Very different looking animal. These guys are a little smaller, uh, slower growers, um, but just absolutely beautiful animals. These this this gray silvery backgrounds with reddy to orange uh, uh, blotches going down the pattern. Babies are noticeably smaller too. Um, uh, than what you tend to see in some of the other low country areas down towards the coast. Um, but yeah, few of us are starting to work with some of these, these, these animals found in a little bit higher elevations and isolated pockets of, of habitat. And you just have a lot of variety of uh, color than what we typically have always associated a red rat or corn snake to look like of as being a, an orange and red uh, animal with black blotches, black bordered blotches. Um, just stunning animals. Uh, next slide. Here is what most people uh, tend to consider to be, you know, red rat, classic red rat here. These are actually pure OKT Hunt Club uh, animals uh, found within the confines of the, of the Hunt Club itself. There's a couple in there from Howie Sherman's old line. There's actually a wild caught one in there as well. Um, some of my group uh, that I work with uh, these these are the, some of the most iconic red rat snakes that everybody everybody loves uh, to see because they're just so beautiful, so clean colored, um, just magnificent animals. So, uh, but this animal these animals aren't found too far away when it comes down to it. Just Jasper County to Cle in South Carolina to Cleveland County, North Carolina, not a far way away, but very very different habitat, very different lifestyles for these animals. Um, and as a result, you have animals that have very different looks, very different habits, um, and makes it really interesting to get to work with all of them without ever having to touch or deal with any sort of morphs, you know, albinos, anatheristics, any of those sort of things. Um, these animals vary drastically across their range, uh, depending on what habitat you're actually finding them in. So, uh, next slide. Hey, Chris, before I go on, Vivian yep. had a question. Um, yep. Are growth rates different for each of the genus? Gro uh, growth rates really vary depending on where an animal is from. Um, uh, like this year, I hatched out red rat snakes from this group here on the screen, from the Okatee Hunt Club. And I hatched out ones from the North Carolina range up in the foothills. And the growth rates are completely different between the two of them. Those South Carolina animals, they grow like weeds. Um, they eat fast, they're a lot more active, and they grow like crazy. Whereas the ones from up in the foothills, um, they're accustomed to a much longer winter naturally. Um, a lot of those babies may not get, may not even get a meal before getting, before it gets cool on them. Um, and even in captivity, you know, I start off with a smaller baby with the, with those foothills animals. Uh, and despite 
eating just as regular as the ones from down near the coast, um, their growth rates are much slower. Um, it really just depends on, on what they evolved to need to do where they live. Um, different factors, different pressures, and that sort of thing kind of come, in, come into effect. All right, I see that question from Nick there. Um, different habitats for one thing. Uh, Jasper County, you're talking about low, down at sea level, uh, pine flatwoods habitat. It's warm, it's warm a lot of the years. There's warm days during the winter um, where these guys are, can, can be active uh, during the winter months. Uh, these guys have different predatory pressures because they, they come from that pine flatwoods where they have an open habitat canopy situation where they have a lot more pressures from uh, birds uh, like raptors and stuff, as well as uh, uh, the uh, like bobcats and stuff like that. Whereas the animals found up in the foothills, it's colder, it's colder a lot longer times of the year. Uh, I've been able to hunt with my friend that started that Cleveland County stock and go to some of the areas uh, where he originally found his, 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 his original animals to start that line. And the habitat's completely different. It's, it's still dry, um, like in both places, which is what the red rats like. They like to be in a drier habitat, um, but the forests are much denser. Um, you've got rocky habitat in areas, in, in, in some of these upper elevation areas, uh, different food sources, uh, pretty much guarantee the ones in the foothills, at least from the ones that I know of in another part of the range in the foothills of, of North Carolina. These guys are, you know, are, are feeding on skinks and stuff as babies, whereas the ones down in the, in the low country are, are going to have more options than that for a longer time of the year. Um, so it just forces these guys um, to survive in, although somewhat similar habitats, um, they're still quite different when it comes down to it. I mean, you got no rocks down in, down in, in the sandy uh, low country in South Carolina where you've got rocky habitat, denser tree cover, um, and that sort of stuff up in the foothills. And that forces them um, to just need to survive differently. Does that kind of make sense, Nick? Groovy. All right. All right, next slide. There we go. Here's another example of what used to be a subspecies of red rat snakes. Um, the rosy rat or keys corn, whatever you want to call them, um, used to be a full subspecies of Gutata years ago. Um, DNA showed that they were not genetically distinct from mainland stock uh, of red rat snakes, but these are some old bloodlines from uh, Big Pine Key in the lower keys. The lower keys now, as of a handful of years ago, became protected, uh, can no longer uh, collect animals from the lower keys, from Big Pine Key South down to Key West. Um, there is still some stock in the US um, hobby of animals from some of these areas, particularly Big Pine Key uh, that are being worked with. Uh, uh, my friend had collected stock back in the late 80s uh, and we're still working with some of those guys uh, today. And there's an example of some of the adults that I've had around. Um, I've got some babies that I'm getting started and established right now. Uh, from a pair of his. So they're really cool, uh, very naturally hypomelanistic. Um, they have a little bit of black to them on some of the babies uh, and that quickly fades to where there just is virtually none or almost none in adults. Uh, there are some uh, corn morphs out there these days in herpetoculture uh, that used some of these keys animals uh, to bring in some of these other factors to make uh, some of these other morphs look different and appear different. Uh, uh, some of the old stock, if anybody remembers any of the old books from years ago where uh, some of the old uh, AVS books and stuff, uh, the, there was banded corn snakes back in the day. Um, a lot of those banded corn snakes came from, from red rat stock from the Keys because uh, a lot of these guys naturally have a very banded pattern. Their, their, their blotches tend to extend down laterally down their side and they don't have a lot of them don't have those little lateral spots um, that you tend to see uh, farther north um, outside on the mainland. So uh, really cool group of animals, not the easiest to work with. Babies are pains in the butts. Adults are really hardy once you kind of get these guys over about a year old. Um, 
but they're uh, they're 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 small, delicate animals um, that uh, are not the easiest to rear. And one reason why a lot of folks don't uh, don't work with a lot of the, the animals from the Keys because they're very challenging as babies. So, uh, next slide. Here's another example of what was a subspecies of of Gutata years ago. Uh, these this is one of the intermontano rat snakes. There's a couple of counties on the western slopes of the Rockies in uh, western Colorado and eastern Utah, where a race of Great Plains rat snakes exists. Uh, they look quite different. Uh, I'm not keeping any at the moment. My partner's keeping all of them at, 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 at this time. Uh, we did hatch out a couple uh, from some of my girls um, this year. And uh, they're, they're really cool. They're like literally a lot of them. This one doesn't really show it that well in the picture. A lot of times these guys are just the blotches are green. A uh, high blotch count compared to some of the ones on the other side of mountains. Uh, smaller race than some of the stuff as well from uh, from the Great Plains region on the eastern side of the, the Rockies. Just isolated little areas uh, of, of range that, that follow uh, a river or two um, on the western slopes of the Rockies. They got separated off as the Rockies uh, rose a long time ago. So really cool little group of snakes that you don't see very much anymore. Uh, very few people are breeding them these days. Uh, I don't know that they ever were popular, but they're um, pretty cool little group of, of animals to be around. So uh, next slide. Here is a, another Great Plains rat snake. Uh, this is in West Texas. Uh, there's an isolated area uh, habitat wise around Alpine, Texas. If you actually look at the geography of Alpine, it kind of sits up as like a little elevated area there. And uh, uh, the Great Plains rat snakes up in that little area within that town vicinity are actually quite different than the ones found in the little lower areas um, outside of that area. You go just a little bit east, west, south, whatever, and the animals have a different look. They're, they're a bit darker, uh, a bit huskier and stuff uh, with an alpine area. And uh, uh, we've, got, we've got a group of these, that a uh, small group of these that we, that we work with. And uh, they're pretty cool and a little bit a little bit more unique maybe than some of the some of the other ones from what areas of West Texas and other parts of the range. So uh, next slide. This is the the Slowinski rat. Uh, some people call them Kasachi corns. Uh, the uh, paper the Burbrink did years ago elevated these guys to full species status. Um, and then the paper published this year put them back down as a subspecies of Emery. Either way, they're a really, really cool rat snake to work with. Uh, first time I laid eyes on uh, the stock that I'm working with that a friend has, I was immediately smitten with them. They're just, you just don't see something that's like this chocolate and mahogany color in anything. They're just really, really cool. And particularly the ones found in Louisiana as opposed to, to Texas um, are, are much more distinct this way, um, east of the Sabine River um, in the Satchin National Forest and adjacent areas with habitats right um, these guys are just absolutely stunning, stunning animals. Um, as you cross the Sabine and go into Texas, they slowly uh, lighten, particularly in the background, and start fading more into a pattern uh, conducive for surviving in a less uh, canopied environment that you see in those in that longleaf habitat in East Texas and uh, and Western Louisiana. So very, very cool species. Not a lot of people breeding them. Uh, we've been working with them for a number of years now, and uh, just a really Interesting animal. Babies are a little bit delicate, a uh, little bit more like a rosy rat maybe as a baby as opposed to some of the other red rat uh, lines, but uh, definitely a, a cool, cool animal to, to be around and uh, to, to see in person. Just very, very different looking snake. Um, bigger like a red rat snake in size, um, temperament wise a little bit more like an emery rat, a little, little spazzy when being bothered and messed with um, as opposed to what you tend to see in a, in a red rat. So next slide. Here's an example of some rosy rats um, or red rats from the northern end of the Keys. Uh, these guys are a little bit bigger, hold better body weight overall than the ones found in the lower Keys habitat. Uh, it is a little bit more abundant in the upper Keys for them to survive. And so in turn, they're a little bit, a uh, little bit stouter and larger animal, but still are naturally quite hypomelanistic. Um, Belly pattern shows a little bit of the checking with some darkness and a little bit of specking of, of black around the saddling, but for the most part, uh, it, it fades out pretty, pretty hypomelanistically as, as they mature and, 
Here's an example of two really extreme animals from the same immediate vicinity uh, in, in the wild. I saw somebody post a question, but I didn't catch what it was. It wasn't a question, it was a okay. comment from, uh, from Jean, um, Jean Meyer saying that uh, Herndon Dowling used to say that taxonomy should be published mm -hmm. in the newspaper it changes so often. So he really appreciates the, um, the strategy that you're taking in terms of the location. Cool. And then um, Russ is talking about um, coloration should not denote a subspecies because we have five or six color morphs of timber rattlesnakes in Maryland, but only one species. Yep, and, and that's where you just, you get, you get controversy. Like uh, I still call timber rattlesnakes down here in the South Cambrakes because they just look different. Their coloration is different. Their body build is different than what you find in the upper elevations, you know, the Appalachians and farther north. Um, but people down here are gonna stick with Atricaudatus as a subspecies of timbers, and they're not gonna stop calling them that. Uh, they're just, they're, uh, their habits are different down here. They don't hibernate down here. Uh, their coloration is different. Their structure, their build is different. Uh, but folks say that it's not a distinct subspecies anymore and it's been on the books for a long time now. So, you know, uh, uh, taxonomy is not, a, not one of those uh, set in stone and it's an ever changing thing and everybody's opinions just vary, unfortunately. Uh, nobody ever wants to, to 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 stick to it. Everybody, you know, every time somebody posts a publishes a paper, uh, you know, there's 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 other folks uh, skilled enough to say that that wasn't done correctly or isn't thorough enough or whatever. Um, there's 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 always controversy with it, unfortunately. So we'll 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 never be rid of this uh, this game, unfortunately. But it is what it is. So. Uh, here's an example of, of some natural variety within one small isolated uh, uh, population of white oak gray rat snakes. Uh, this is uh, some of my adult, or my primary adult trio of Santa Rosa uh, County white oaks from Panhandle of Florida. All three of these animals are pretty distinctly different looking and all found on the same piece of property, um, one, guy's, one guy's house. Um, uh, you've got a just crazy awesome you know, strawberry colored animal. You've got a pretty classic looking, very light colored animal. Um, and then you've got uh, uh, animal with much darker markings. Um, this picture doesn't really show the appreciation for what these guys, if you had these guys up close to you, um, there's all sorts of like peaches and oranges and all this sort of stuff worked into even the lighter colored animals um, scales. It's, they're, it, it's amazing how naturally variable the gray rats along the Panhandle of Florida are, despite the fact we call them white oaks or just gray rat snakes, there, there's a lot of variation, particularly as you get to the farther western end of it um, than necessarily on the eastern side as you get like back towards like Apalachicola and stuff like that. They do vary there, but maybe not quite as drastically as you tend to see um, out more towards Pensacola and, and, and that end of the range. There's, there's a little bit more variety and actually um, most people like the classic ones from more the the Apalachicola direction or closer to that, that end of the river where they're just a much more wider silvery colored, which I, I do work with them um, as well. But I actually really have a soft spot for some of these guys because the tones and the colors built into these guys are amazing. Um, just don't tend to see them um, at, at elsewhere. Uh, most people just want to have the, the lighter colored animals, which is great. I love them too, but uh, I think these guys are pretty remarkable. Next slide. And here's an example of ones from the, the eastern side of the Apalachicola River um, in Franklin and Liberty counties. Super silvery gray animals, very light colored, very faded patterns for the most part. Um, just very different looking animals. Um, and yet uh, Burbrink actually had separated these two populations as being totally separate species, um, whereas they used to be a subspecies. Now, according to the paper it came out this year, they're both in the same species. They're both under Allegheny Ansys. So again, I go back to calling them by their locality and I try to keep within locality peer groups and I leave it at that and they can keep changing my rat snake names while they want. So next slide. Here's an example of uh, one from uh, Pender County, North Carolina along the coast near Wilmington vicinity. Uh, 
this kind of goes into some of the substantiation for the paper that came out this year where the yellow rat snake, uh, the striped form uh, coming out of Peninsula Florida follows up along the coast of North Carolina, up to North Carolina, where you can see this animal still going through its onogenetic change uh, is going to be a distinctly striped animal as an adult. It won't be a yellow animal like you would see farther south in coastal Georgia and Florida. Uh, it'll be somewhere in the gray, olivey, sort of toned uh, as an adult, um, but still develops the distinctly striped uh, pattern that isn't as obviously observed as you go farther west. Um, it just seems to be restricted and the paper suggests that uh, that the yellow rat uh, evolved from down there and worked their way up and then merged with Alleghenyensis um, as you get away from the coast and the low country. So, um, but definitely a cool animal. Um, I'm not breeding this group yet. I just uh, got a pair and this is one of them. Uh, so I'm hoping in the next couple of years, I'll start doing these guys and get to learn a little bit more about uh, their on a genetic color change, as well as uh, how different the babies look than some of my animals from farther south in the range and just see how much different there is between these coastal animals um, that develop a similar phenotype along the way. So next slide. Here is a pretty cleanly colored and marked black rat snake. Um, this one would be classified as an Eastern rat by Burbrink. Uh, I don't even know what the common name is for the other one, but this is one of my Spartanburg adults, um, really clean black animals uh, within that part of the range. And uh, pretty easy guys to work with for the most part, huge babies, easy to start, very, very different than size-wise than some of the other uh, rats a little farther coastally and south. Uh, and that is likely goes to they're from a colder habitat, they have a shorter season, they've got to put out babies that are a little bit bigger because of competition for food reasons. Uh, so in turn, they uh, give me great big eggs and not very many of them are huge gigantic babies. So uh, pretty pretty cool group of, of, of rats to work with. I'm fortunate to have gotten those from a friend that lives up in that area. All right, uh, husbandry. Uh, husbandry is a loaded question. This, there are so many sources over the years. Books started getting published in the late 80s, early 90s, documenting you know, how to keep rat snakes and as well as the kings and stuff like that, but how to keep these rat snakes and, and to do it successfully. Um, it can vary a lot depending on what part of the range these different rat snakes come, whether you're talking about Transpecos rat from Texas versus the yellow rat snake from Florida or black rat snake from Maryland, et cetera. Um, there are some modifications that need to be done, particularly with the Western with the Western races of of, of rats and subox and beards and stuff like that. Um, those guys just don't experience a whole lot of humidity in their lives, um, and so there's definitely some some husbandry adjustments that need to be made to accommodate those guys and 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 have uh, success with them. Uh, and as we discussed, uh, the different types of rat snakes. And I'm again mostly work with the uh, the Katata group and Obsoleta group. Um, housing for these guys can just vary depending on which locality you're working with, how quick they're going to grow, um, and and what your intentions are with them, so to speak. Um, some of my red rats just grow crazy faster than. My other localities and so those guys got to be moved up to bigger cages a lot quicker and I have to be ready to accommodate that within six months whereas the other ones can stay in a smaller cage for a year because their growth rate is half of what the other ones are. Um, my black rats hatch out huge they got to go right into bigger cages um, as babies and they got to be moved up you know very quickly. I mean they, they start off on pinks and within two or three months they're already on fuzzies and they're on hoppers you know, by six, seven, eight months old. It's just crazy how quick those guys grow as compared to, you know, a, a, a rat snake. I, I have some from coastal South Carolina, uh, very different animals, just very different animals. So uh, all those parameters kind of have to be taken into account of, of what species you're working with, where that species comes from um, to be able to accommodate cage size and specific husbandry parameters. Um, uh, next slide. For folks interested in the Western species, uh, particularly subox, uh, as well as being covered in that, uh, some of the greens and the Baja rats, uh, and I think he covers bear dye in there. This book by Dusty Rhodes is just an absolute masterpiece um, 
covering uh, those Western species, their husbandry needs, the breeding successes, and all that going over the different variations across the range. Uh, anybody that's herped in West Texas and within that very Eastern New Mexico uh, sees that as you go to different counties and different parts of the county, substrate's different, substrate color's different. And as a result, these guys look different across their ranges and why a lot of breeders um, keep a lot of these, these, these subox locality pure because they vary drastically um, from one part of the range to the other. So I always highly recommend this book to folks that uh, have an interest in those, those guys out West. And uh, there's a lot of good tips and husbandry practice uh, recommendations within that book that can be applied to all of the other rat snakes as well. So um, hi highly recommend that book if you get anybody has any interest in those Western guys, uh, for sure. Next slide. This is a really important thing to me. Uh, that book goes into detail and covers that. Um, it's a very, very important thing for those Western species to, to have low humidity, high ventilation, making sure that they're, even just the water bowls within their cages aren't causing moist, stagnant air in their environment. But mm. ventilation with husbandry across the board, um, when you're talking about these colubrids and, and rat snakes especially too, um, is tends to not be appreciated as much and in this day and age a lot of the you know uh, keepers and breeders tend to use uh, rack systems and stuff like that which i completely and 100 percent endorse uh the big thing for me with some of the designs on some of them is that they're enclosed rack systems with you know bins of different sizes slid into them with that enclosed area it doesn't allow for good ventilation and these bins tend to have very minimal ventilation holes put into them that's great if you're dealing with a tropical species of python or something like that, where you need to hold humidity and 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 you need lower ventilation. Those guys thrive in that. Uh, these guys these guys do not thrive in that. These guys need high ventilation, um, good airflow. Don't want stagnant air in there. Um, their metabolisms are high. They defecate a lot, and all that goes into uh, helping have a clean, healthy environment within the cage by having lots of ventilation um, available um, to their immediate environment. So, uh, and I'll have some examples of, of what I mean by that uh, coming up. Next slide. Here's an example of some of my big bins uh, where some of my adult rats um, are kept in groups. And you can see just even on the front of those cages, I have lots and lots of holes in them. Actually take that back, that is actually some of my smaller bins. Those are some of my mid-sized bins there, but you can see those those bins are heavily uh, perforated with ventilation holes, and it's like that all the way around them um, to help ensure that the, the environment in there just doesn't get stagnant, moist at all, or any more than I have to. Living here in the Southeast, it's very difficult even this time of year. Uh, find one of my monitors here in my room. Uh, I'm still sitting at 56%, and this is extremely low for me, um, and that was, near the floor, it'll range somewhere within the low 50s around my room, depending on what part of the room it's in. Um, that's low for me. Summertime, my room is between 70 and 90, and it's a just challenge to deal with that. So air movement and, and high ventilation is extremely important. Next slide. Here we go, smaller cages, uh, shoebox sizes, small sweater box sizes, heavily ventilated along the side, just to help ensure that, um, that the the humidity doesn't stay in there any more than and it is. When you have these moist environments, uh, it's just a breeding ground for bacteria, mold, funguses, all these things. And uh, breathing in that air for them is, is not ideal. Uh, there's a lot more attention being paid to, uh, particularly with the molds and funguses, as causing problems with these guys. It's, it's not really well researched at this point. Uh, but it has been, a lot of folks are acknowledging uh, the importance of ventilation and reducing uh, that moist environment to help uh, try to keep down some of these, these issues. Some of these, some of these different snakes uh, within the colubrid realm seem to be more susceptible to these, to these bacteria and mold and fungus uh, growths within their enclosure than others. And that can vary from one animal to another or locality, one locality to another. Uh, so it's really, um, it's a really big factor for me that I am constantly um, improving in my cages and my husbandry with my animals 
Um, and it, it really actually started more from the fact that my other main thing I work with is water snakes and they have absolutely zero tolerance for stagnant moist air. They will stress out, they will get blisters and they are going to go off food and die on you. And so keeping um, a very highly ventilated uh, enclosure of whatever nature you use, it doesn't matter whether you're using racks, tubs, bins, aquariums, exoteric cages, it, it doesn't matter. It just matters that the elements and the environment is provided correctly as opposed to whatever aesthetic appeal that you have for that environment. So uh, next slide. These are, this is the picture of my, some of my big, my big breeder bins. Um, you can see how heavily ventilated they are. It goes down all around on the sides as well. Um, this is the only ones that I truly have um, that are like the lidless slide bins. But you will also notice um, the design of this particular uh, rack setup, which I'm in the process of getting ready to build a couple more of these. They're not enclosed racks. They're, 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 they're shelves with uprights supporting those shelves, but it's completely open all the way around. So it allows good ventilation all the way around the enclosure so that uh, nothing just gets really trapped up in there odor wise, moisture wise, et cetera, um, to just create a, a less ideal and unhealthy environment for them. So uh, next slide. This is an example of a, a typical uh, hatchling neonate uh, container that I start these guys off in. Um, it's, got, it's got elements and, and, and the, a lot of the things in there albeit simple, um, they, they, they serve purposes and why I, I use them in there. One is I've got a substrate that's dry that they can burrow into. Um, I use pine shavings. That's my favorite choice. I've been using it for decades. Um, I have a, uh, like a half a paper towel roll or a toilet paper roll has been partially crushed down that they can hide up inside of. I use a lid from like a sour cream, cottage cheesy type container in there that provides a twofold. Um, uh, use in there. One is I can lay food on top of it and leave that for them um, to eat, as well as a lot of the baby rat snakes, particularly a lot of the stuff from Florida, they are almost always going to hide under that tight, flat, secure area underneath that lid, like almost all of them. Deckard's rats, yellow rats, Everglades rats, rosy rats, almost all of them hide up underneath that um, in their early months of their life, and some of them continue to do it as they get older as well. Um, they've got an easily cleaned water bowl, easily replaced water bowl, just an eight ounce deli cup um, in there. Uh, got some ventilation holes in there. I'm getting actually ready to go back through a lot of my little hatchling containers and add five zillion more holes to all of them because some of them don't have um, as much holes in them as I want because I can catch when I'm going through them and I'll see moisture holding on the lid on some of them um, and I don't want it that. So I'm gonna be going back through some of them that don't have enough holes in them and just, just perforating the heck out of them uh, here. Here's another slide. This is a standard shoebox setup uh, for some of the neonates that I'm gonna be keeping long-term and I go ahead and move them right up in, into a slightly bigger box um, for the following year, basically. It has all the basic same elements um, that the, the smaller container has, although I have the room to give them the option to get up off the ground and I use it through some, some wire, some coated wire um, that I just make a, like a little little structure over the top so they can get up. They still got hides. They still got the flat hide. They got a place to have food. They got water bowl, a little bit bigger water bowl because it's a bigger container. Um, that gives them kind of all their elements um, in one situation um, in just a slightly bigger version. Next slide. And here again, here is like a, a medium size, uh, sub-adult, small adult. This size cage is good for um, a pair of red rat snakes and I, I also raise out in trying to think which ones are in there. Uh, I think that some of my gulf hammocks, some of my, my sub-adult gulf hammock girls are in that cage. Um, I've kind of got all the things. They like tight, confining hides. Um, and I found that paper towel rolls are just the cat's meow for a lot of these guys. Um, I do have to change them out pretty routinely, uh, again, because they get soiled. Um, I also provide other hides as far as using some of the, the sour cream type containers, the whole cut in the lid. Um, uh, Nick, I don't offer temperature gradients. I use ambient. I just keep my room set to a set temperature uh, and, and, and just manage it that way. I keep my 
my room in the upper 70s to just low 80s and it fluctuates a little bit by the year as well as where in the room it is. Uh, the cages that are up higher are a little bit warmer as opposed to the cages down lower. Like I keep my fox snakes down to the bottom where they're gonna stay, you know, uh, 76 to 79 most of the time, maybe a little lower depending um, where some of the upper guys if the heater pops on like this time of year, it'll cruise up to 81, 82 towards the upper, upper shelves. Um, so that's how I go by it. I don't like using individual heat. The only thing I have any individual heat on is I have a couple of Indian sand boas that I keep, my only non-colubrid, and uh, they just have a little heat pad sitting on the shelf that their cages then sit on top of. Um, and that's just supplemental heat so that they've got a hot spot because uh, their needs are a little bit more tropical. Uh, but I, uh, I don't, for various reasons, don't use um, uh, a heat gradient. Just my environment where I live here in, in the Southeast, um, as well as I don't like using a lot of electricity. That's fire hazards. It's, it's, uh, it's too many people that lose their collections uh, to fires and, and meltings. And I just try to avoid as much of that as possible and prefer just to use um, a space heater and or my window, depending on the time of the year to manage the, the temperatures in the room, as well as adjusting my air conditioner vent and using fans um, to just manage it and keep it where I want it. Um, and I keep animals that all do well and thrive under those conditions. One reason why I don't keep some of the Western species because I use the summer heat here in Alabama to warm the room from the window and my humidity on average is 75 to 90%. And those Western guys just don't tolerate that well. Um, I can't manage them for, you know, a year or more, um, well, they get they get respiratory issues and go off food and likely getting some fungal mold infections that I can't diagnose or, or manage in any way. So uh, I just stick with some of the guys that thrive a little bit better in these, these environments. Um, nesting and laying hides, I, I figured I'd touch on this. Uh, everybody has their own uh, uh, way that they like to offer nesting containers. Um, nothing is wrong. The animals basically need a confining small hide spot with a substrate that's that's damp enough um, to make them feel that like their eggs are going to survive in that area and that they can feel comfortable. Um, everybody uses a variety of stuff: sphagnum moss, peat moss. Uh, I've seen cocoa bark. I've seen I've I've used sand. Um, I, there's a, I've seen cypress mulch. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of things people use based on what's available to them, what they consider affordable, what they consider just as best uh, for them overall. Um, I found that peat moss is great. I, I use that. Um, I like it. It's cheap. It's affordable. Um, it's easily available. And, and I found reasons why, which I'll show some slides of why I like it a little bit better more than the more commonly kept st used stuff of sphagnum moss. Um, and it's where I touched on it. Here, under this picture, this is a one of the taller uh, coffee, plastic coffee bins. Um, I have people save me these things up the wazoo. I use the short ones for water bowls. I use the big ones for hide boxes. Um, I have observed by using peat moss, because it acts similar to the soils that these guys would naturally be laying their eggs in in the wild, um, allows to show natural nesting behavior um, that you don't get to normally see with other substrates like some of the barks and the sphagnum mosses. Um, if I leave my females alone for a day when they're finished nesting and I can come back, or if just because that's when I found them when it was able to check on them based on work and life schedules, I will come back in and I can tell that she's deposited a clutch of eggs in there because she has packed the entire hide area down flat and covered up everything. Um, prior to that, I will see her sitting in a bowl shaped environment inside there. And once she has kind of recovered energy wise from laying that clutch, usually by the next day, she will go back, she will cover all those eggs up, she will pack it down and she will leave the nest box. And it will look like nothing ever happened in there. You dig down and quite to the contrary. Uh, next slide. Here, that same exact bin, I have dug out, slowly dug out and it's packed in tight. And you can see eggs deposited down in the bottom that I am having to carefully work out of this well-packed in peat moss. Um, even my partner who's been keeping and breeding stuff since the late sixties had never seen that. And I told him about what I was starting to see just by my choice of 
of, of substrate to, to use as nesting material, um, that I was able to start seeing this with almost all my rat snakes. Um, I don't know that I've seen it with a few king snakes that I keep, mostly because I try to get my eggs out of my king snake cages uh, uh, somewhat promptly. I think one year I did see my some of my Hendry Florida kings. Uh, she, I think she had uh, done a good bit of covering on one of hers uh, before I had gotten to it. But uh, it, it's a pretty neat uh, experience to see this, and, I, and I'll see multiple animals all doing it um, uh, every year. So it's pretty, pretty cool just by using that. Here's an example of a female that's finished finishing. This is a Gulf hammock rat, um, her clutch. She probably finished because that's why I probably took the time to take a picture of her. Um, you can see her still sitting in somewhat of a depressed bowl situation inside the bin, uh, but she has not left it and she has not covered it yet. Um, uh, I can't recall in that particular case if I left them for her. I tend to worry about bothering females uh, in case they're not finished, if I can't tell that they're finished. Um, my, my gut instinct is just leave them alone. Um, I, I put them back in, leave them back in the container, and I'll come back the next day or the next morning, whatever the case may be. And, and, and go and worry about retrieving the eggs then. I, I don't want to stress out the female and have her retain an egg or do whatever uh, to, to screw up the situation. I tend to be very leave my animals alone um, kind of approach to the situation. So next slide. Here is some of the fruits of the labor. These are some uh, little Western fox snakes in the Nebraska's uh, hatching out and coming out and it's the goal. I use um, the same peat moss as nesting, as incubation substrate as well. Uh, Again, goes just like the nesting material. People use all sorts of stuff out there. Uh, vermiculite and perlite is super popular and what a lot of people use. I've used it in the past. Um, I started using this stuff and I can get these big bales of peat moss from the lows and stuff. And a lot of times you can, I don't know what they cost normally, somewhere between 10, 20 bucks for these big compressed bales. But if you watch, they'll have damage bags where it's just torn and I can pick them up for one to $3 for these great big bags. And uh, with all my different nest bins and incubation containers, uh, I go through a good bit of it. And so uh, I find it to be a very affordable option that I've uh, found to be very successful with as well. So uh, next slide. Here's another example of some babies uh, hatching out. These are some gray rat snakes. Uh, looking at the picture, those look like probably Santa Rosa counties um, hatching out there. You can see multiple ones pip that haven't come out. You got at least one sibling there that's come out. Uh, these guys take days to sometime a whole week between the first pip to the last one finally coming out. Um, I joke to people and just say, well, the hatch date I gave you is when the first one pipped. That's just kind of what I go with. First pip is, is, is the birth date, even if some of them didn't even pip for two or three days, sometimes four days afterwards and didn't even hatch until seven days later. Um, it's kind of no easy way to go about that and keep up with them. Um, I just kind of just put a date on of whenever I first saw the first pip on them. So next slide. This is where I was just talking about the incubation practices. Uh, folks do all sorts of stuff and have success. Um, from the type of container that they actually put the eggs in um, to the substrates that they use in there. Uh, in my case, uh, uh, my room temperature for my snakes, I just put them, put them in there in the containers that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them hatch in. And I just throw them on a shelf in the closet in the snake room. A lot of guys do that with colubrids. They just put them on the shelves in their room and the temperatures that they keep their colubrids at does just fine. You know, upper 70s to low 80s at best and upper 70s is usually better, uh, in my opinion. Uh, some folks are really particular about separating their eggs up. They'll break those clutches up individually and they'll put them into, you know, separate them all up individually. I don't mess with them. If they're gonna come apart, if they're already apart on their own, that's fine. If they're stuck together, I leave them alone and don't bother them. I don't wanna take a chance of damaging them, trying to get them apart. It's, it's not worth it to me. Uh, they're meant to be stuck together like that. Uh, so I just leave them, leave them the way they, the way they are. Um, a lot of breeders uh, have found, particularly with these, with these colubrids, that doing them at a little cooler temperature and letting it take a little bit longer, uh, you tend to get on average a little bit hardier, bigger babies. Um, in general, that's my experience as well. So I don't put them in an incubator. I could put them in an incubator and put them at 85 degrees and get those babies to hatch out really quick. Um, I tend to leave them in there and just whatever my room temperature ends up being in the top shelf of my closet. And I have the ones, you know, most of my guys with the exception of the fox snakes, you know, I don't get them hatching. They probably don't, most of them don't pit between 70 till 70, 75 days, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and it's just fine with me. 
Uh, the fox snakes are a totally different situation. Those guys will start pipping at 45 days. They're from a much farther northern part of the range, and they just naturally um, develop quicker. There's some people that say, and I don't know what research has been done on it, that maybe there's some development before they're even laid. I don't know what the case is. There may be a partially already grown baby inside those eggs, maybe when they're laid. I'm not clear on that. Um, I, I, I haven't read anything to substantiate that, but um, those guys will hatch, start pipping at 45 days. It's a very qu quick cycle. There's some of the first ones to breed coming out of, out of hibernation, and they're the first ones to lay eggs. Um, they're, 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 their objective is to get those babies out, try to get some meals in them before winter comes, which in those northern parts of the range, you know, these guys will start going off food pretty early. And sometimes it's, you know, late September, early October, and these guys aren't going to get another meal. So big, hefty, hardy babies, big eggs, um, short incubation time, try to give them. That's what they've uh, uh, been proven to, uh, to, to survive best with in, in those northern parts of the range. So um, cooling, man, that's a loaded subject. I've got some rat snakes that I don't have to cool at all, and they just breed off of the fluctuation of light cycle from my window. Other ones like the fox snakes, they got to be cooled for, you know, 10, 12 plus weeks. Uh, I've done some even 14 weeks. Uh, it, it really varies uh, depending on what part of the range they're from. Generally, the stuff a little farther south can get away with a little less and the ones up farther north need a little bit more. Um, uh, I had stuff this year that I didn't cycle on purpose because I wanted to give them the break and work on my room uh, during the winter months. And some of the stuff from Central Florida like Gulf Hammocks and my Seminole County Yellows, they bred. Yet the stuff from down in the Keys and extreme South Florida didn't. Uh, whatever, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but it's just some of these guys can naturally breed. And a lot of folks that breed red rat snakes will attest that you don't have to cycle some of these guys. You have to give them some sort of cycle exposure, um, whether it be fasting, a little light change, whatever, um, to help stimulate that ovulation. But uh, the cooling practices for some folks, you know, you guys up in Maryland can do things very, very differently. I know Tom has the ability to use his basement, you know, because temperatures are great down there. I don't have that luxury down here in the deep south. Uh, we don't, we get cold, we get temperatures in the teens, sometimes single digits, but none of it lasts long enough to do a proper cooling cycle for these guys. And so I have uh, a typical refrigerator modified um, with a uh, thermostat. Um, and I can control the temperature to what is in there and I can set it up into the mid upper fifties like I want. And I just have that much room to work with to put certain groups in there. And I just cycle them through starting in September until usually April-ish somewhere, right? I, you'll have somewhere between eight and 14 groups of snakes cooling at any given time. Some are in there for four weeks and some are in there for three months. It just depends. I just cycle them through based on the needs for those particular guys. And I usually myself try to push trying to keep them in there as little as I need to. Um, if I, I'll sometimes, you know, if an animal went six weeks, you know, the year before, I may push it and try to do it four and a half weeks and pull them out and see if I have success with them. Um, I'm always trying to learn from these guys uh, what they need, what they what it takes to be successful with them. So I'm always pushing um, to to try to find how little I can get, I actually have to cool them. Um, Cause that's, you know, it's a dangerous time. Snakes can die during cooling. Uh, if they've got stuff going on in their system that you're just not privy to. And so uh, it really just drops their immune system down and it's, uh, it can be dangerous. So I've got water snakes that I don't have to cool any more than three or four weeks. I can put them in the fridge three or four weeks, wake them back up and I'm gonna get babies from them every year. No, no problems whatsoever. So um, a lot of folks have very set regimented days where they last feed cool them down, wake them up, and they have success with that too. And all of it works, all of it works. It just depends on what everybody's situation is, is the best way to, to, to mitigate uh, the success with that. Here's some wonderful little baby Slowinski rats from a couple of years ago. Uh, very different, they almost look like little anatheristic corn snakes uh, when they're born, and then they grow into those just beautiful mahogany colored animals. Um, usually by a year old, they've got a good bit of color already to them, and they just get deeper and deeper uh, in color as they get older. Next slide. Here's a little group of, of Gulf hammock rats, one of my favorite rat snakes to work with. Unfortunately, we've been uh, lucky enough to be the only ones working with albinos. I'm not typically a morph guy, um, but if something falls into my lap, so to speak, I will, I will work with it and keep some uh, locality pure genetic programs going. And uh, we kind of have a two, two side approach to this. We had 
Uh, my partner had caught a while, caught one in some of the same roads that he had been cruising since the early 70s. And he never backbred any of his stock before. He always brought new males in every time he put forth the next generation, uh, every 10 or 15 years. And um, he, um, I took two animals that were half siblings to each other and bred them last year. And we hatched out some of the first albinos. Uh, we're still working on the het situation out of the wild caught albino, but the stock is all from the same immediate little couple of little square mile area. So as far as we're concerned, it's probably the exact same gene. We just kind of lucked into it from two points. Um, so it's pretty cool. This is still a, an early project in the works right now with these guys, but pure, pure locality, Levy County, Gulf Hammock rats. So next slide. Uh, here's some really nice uh, white oak gray rat snakes. Uh, looking at that head pattern, those are going to be some of the Apalachicolas from Liberty and Franklin counties. Uh, next slide. These are some of the coolest things in the world: baby fox snakes. Uh, those are some of the uh, some of the Nebraska babies from a year or so ago. I can't remember which year those those were from. Um, but really cool little stocky guys, just easy starters. A lot of times they'll eat even before they go through their first shed. Um, Really cool, really cool little fun guys to work with. Next slide. Uh, kind of rounding out what I was going over, kind of covered most of my bases. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions uh, for things maybe I didn't cover or didn't cover clearly. Um, these are just points to contact me if anybody cares to see what I'm doing, see the stupid pictures of some of my rat snakes that I post, um, how to get in touch with me, that sort of thing. On Instagram, it's just at Dark Horse Herp. And on, uh, on Facebook, I have a page, Dark Horse Herpiculture. So uh, those are ways to message me or just see what kind of uh, what kind of silly stuff I'm working with these days. So those are good contact points. Um, I think there was another slide after that. I can't remember. Oh yeah, and this is the other thing that is really cool and I actually like better than my rat snakes is I work with water snakes and more specifically I work with banded water snakes, all three subspecies. I work with a lot of different localities across the range, um, and. Uh, these guys, these these guys are are some of the coolest stuff and not as appreciated as uh, as they should be. Not necessarily the easiest things to work with. A few parameters uh, that need to be adhered to, particularly ventilation and low humidity. Uh, but uh, some of the coolest stuff uh, out there, and I work with a lot of them and trying to understand um, both on a genetic change and genetic inheritance of the colors. These guys, particularly banded water snakes, are very, very naturally variable in the wild, even within the same immediate area. Although certain areas of the range tend to show certain phenotypes more so than other parts of the range. Um, but there's still a lot to be understood uh, uh, with how different colors and patterns are inherited, as well as the really, really drastic color changes these guys go from, from fresh, freshly born neonates uh, to the adult phase, and so I'm doing lots of lots of locality breeding, and have been for a number of years now with these guys to uh, try to better understand it, because apparently nobody cares to work with them um, out there. So I'm putting the time in on it. So thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, Nick said, um, Tom said you are you are a weird guy that actually loves water snakes, and Nick yes. said, do they ever they ever came out? Uh, they have a bad reputation. They have a bad reputation. I uh, I keep a lot of wild caught water snakes, um, and uh, most of my collection is banded water snakes. I do have some mangrove waters and a couple of yellow bellies at the moment. Um, uh, but yes, on the whole, most of them do. Uh, dispositions tend to vary east to west, whereas like a lot of the Florida banded water snakes tend to be a lot better tempered. Um, then let's say some of the broadbands, some of the most vicious animals I've ever worked with um, are broadbanded water snakes. Like I have one group from Brazoria County, Texas, two females at the moment that like I don't like working with because I come out bleeding and covered in crap every single time. Um, whereas I have got water snakes from, from different areas in Florida that are wild caught stock that I've collected myself that like outside of the initial catching and even sometimes then, that never try to bite again. They may kind of test me because they think I'm going to be feeding them that moment, which I usually am. Um, but um, extremely tame, laid back, um, easy going animals. Uh, some of the babies can be a little bit wiry depending on the locality um, that they're from. But uh, 
on the whole, like I can pull most of mine out, like that one in that picture. Um, and I've got a group of those that's from Sarasota County uh, that are just great um, females, especially uh, once you get them work working with them and breeding them. They're uh, they get very keyed in on 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 you working with them because they know you're a food source and they just come out right out to you and come out and crawl out onto you and take food from your hand. So. We might have to have you come back and talk about water snakes one of these days. <laughs> Right I'll be now, happy to I'll be happy to do a talk on banded water snakes any day. But back, uh, anybody have any questions for Chris? I mean, my my mind is a, is is heavy with new information, um, and those beautiful pictures of all of the different varieties of of of, uh, of rat snakes. So thank you. Um, any questions for um, Chris? You can raise your hand and unmute and ask, or put it in the chat box. Anybody? My, well, I, I was going to make a joke that says that you must eat a lot of um, sour cream at your house because you have a lot of sour cream containers we, in your... Hey, like it doesn't everybody like Mexican tacos and stuff? I mean, come on. Like, I just been saving them. For, I just been saving them for years. My wife likes cottage cheese and we eat a lot of sour cream. So I've just been saving them for years and just have a huge stock of them at this point. And I just save every single one of them. Like, I just, I save them all because I use them well, it, chronically. Right. And so if people want to, in, in, with your business and they can um, get in touch with you and mm -hmm. um, any other services that you provide. Yeah, uh, just, you know, Facebook and Instagram is the easiest way to get in touch with me through those messenger services. That's um, uh, my, my, I know my Facebook account, uh, my, my Facebook page says I respond very, I respond very quickly. So I, I obviously stay on top of that. So um and yeah. Linda wants to know, do you have a good book on the natural history of rat snakes? Um, is, is the, is the road, Dusty Rose one? Uh, that, that one is, it, that, it, it's a great book, but that is, is really a book specifically about the Transpecos rat snake. Um, and, but he also does cover some of those other Western species um, as well out there. It is not going to touch at all on any of the Eastern stuff, um, all the black snails, et cetera, or the red rats or any of those kind of guys. Um, they're really, honestly, they're really, isn't that I can think of um and there may be something out there but I'm not aware of it uh there's a lot of books on red rat snakes uh because they're so popular with all the morphs and stuff out there there's a there's a lot of books I think out there I don't know I don't really get into buying and get into books too much um I get into field guides and published papers more like field research stuff than I do on uh pet trade type books um I, I used to have some of those and I like the old ones, like the old vivarium, uh, advanced vivarium system stuff that Philippe Fajali had done years ago. Those were great in the nineties. Um, uh, but I've gone more into, I tend to get more out of papers and stuff that, um, that deal with field research uh, on, 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 on animals. And I'm not really, I'm not really aware of any good books on, on rat snakes. At least I don't have any, and if there is, I haven't seen it. So, uh, I'm sure somebody can correct anybody me out there. If anybody listening knows of a good um, book on rat snakes, you can put it in the chat box for Linda. She's looking for one. There's an old um, book that was in the 90s of called like Rat Snakes and Their Kin um, that was put out by TFH, if I remember. And I'm trying to think who did that book. Uh, God, I can't remember. I used to have it. It was a yellow book. Uh, it kind of covered all rat snakes. There was Old World and New World in it. And it was a pretty decent book for its time. Uh, it was a good hobbyist book at the time. Um, I sold my copy years ago. Uh, just didn't have need it as a resource. Again, I tend to tend to find more value in understanding more about the natural history of the animals and doing finding out about field research results um, and, and field guides and ranges and understanding biogeography of where these animals come from, so that I can curtail that to to having success with them in captivity. And Vivian um, was interested for snakes not being bred. Um, is mm -hmm. it normal for them to slow down in eating when winter comes around? Yeah, they're going to get exposed to environmental pressures. You know, whether it's a light in the room, the ambient temperature of your house, um, humidity changes, barometric pressure changes, all these things. Even if 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 
you're not specifically trying to cool them down and do something with them intentionally. They're being exposed to these to these stimulus, and and frequently animals will just naturally um, uh, back off, taper off, be less interested in that sort of thing. Um, just like males in the springtime will a lot of times not want to eat because they've got breeding on their mind and they don't care anything. They're, they, they, they're worried about trying to find a female. So they just forego wanting to feed um, for periods of time. So um, it's not unusual. Just roll with it. Make sure they're not weight, losing weight drastically um, and, 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 le and leave them be as far as doing that. Offer them periodically. And if they just don't want it, they don't want it. You know, as long as they're not losing weight drastically, it's not a big deal. Any other question? Oh, here we got Linda. Do wild rat snakes have a home range? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would assume on the whole that they do. I, I can't think of a paper that I've read recently that kind of covers that. Um, on the whole, most of these, these, th these colubrids, whether it's, you're talking about water snakes, I, I tend to know a little bit more about the water snakes and that than, than rat snakes, only because of some of the field time I've spent with them. Um, they're going to, to some extent, yeah, they're not going to be ranging huge, um, but they do tend to keep a particular range. Like I know with water snakes, particularly with the Midland water snakes, common, the southern subspecies of the northerns that you guys have up there, there's a particular creek that I've frequently hiked over the years near me. And, and, and I've watched exactly how some of these same exact snakes use very specific basking areas as opposed to other ones that when they drop into the water have access to get up into the bank and the root, in the root systems of those plants to get away from me, from predators, from whatever's coming by that they consider a threat. Whereas other branches don't have these retreats to go to and these animals, I will see repeatedly some of the same animals in a couple of very specific set parts within this, this, this same creek. Um, and never going farther down and never going farther up. They'll have their certain three or four animal uh, spots that they know they've got a safe way to get away um, from any sort of threat that comes along. So um, I'm pretty sure rat snakes are going to have some of that same stuff. I'm not immediately familiar with any field research that's kind of covered that. Um, I know there has been some work up in Ontario um, with the populations of the rat snakes up there. And I know there's some folks that have done some, uh, uh, particularly with foxes and stuff like that, some of the more northern parts of the range, these guys do. And that's one other thing. There's a big difference between what northern end of the range for these rat snakes uh, have to do with as far as the southern, because down here, they don't den up. They don't have to find these deep hibernaculums to, to, to survive in in the south they can just burrow under the substrate and they're going to survive anything versus up there you guys got to have you know deep crevices deep into the earth below a frost line we don't have a frost line down here so it's going to really kind of depend on the part of the range as to how much of a home range they're going to end up having those guys are only going to stray so far up north from where they know is a safe secure place to survive the winter whereas down here in the south they're not going to be as fixed to that um, as, as they would be uh, farther north. All right, thank you, Chris. Anybody else have questions? We'll wrap it up. Oh, Brad has put in there rat snakes, a hobbyist guide to... Um, yeah, that's, that's the one I was talking about. The, the, I think it's yellow. Um, can't remember what was on the cover the, now because I haven't actually seen the cover of the book in years. But uh, yeah, that was, that was the only one that I can think of that has been around um, kind of covering rat snakes in a general sense. There's a couple bigger books. Um, uh, there's one from Asia uh, covering some of the Asian rat snakes uh, that a guy named Dieter had done, uh, as well as a general big book, um, just a, a laffe that I've been trying to get my hands on. It costs a couple hundred dollars when you can find it. And I have not been able to get my hands on it. It kind of covered all the rat snakes all over the world. Um, it came out in the 90s and it just hasn't been reprinted and it's impossible to get your hands on apparently. Um, I've been trying and I just can't seem to get my hands on it. So that book that, that Brad had commented on um, is probably the only one other than maybe some of the small advanced vivarium systems that would cover rat snakes or 
there's also a handful of ones out there on corn snake on red rat snakes because they're so popular there's Kathy Love's got books and there's sure a couple other ones that I haven't really paid any attention to um, going over all the different color morphs and basic husbandry and that sort of stuff and all the, the genetic uh, <coughs> um, understanding to have these different morphs uh, come along, whether they're, they're single gene or combo genes and that sort of thing, so. All right, well, we're gonna call it a night. Um, thank you so much for sharing no your knowledge and with us. Remember next for uh, for December, we have the Rattlesnake Concert, uh, Conservancy is going to be talking about rattlesnake conservation efforts that they are spearheading. Uh, so you want to, don't want to miss that. It is not on our typical night that we're meeting. It's on December 16th. So just go to MarylandNature.org to RSVP for that to get the Zoom details. And um, we hope to see you soon. Buy a raffle ticket. Stay well, stay safe, stay curious, and um, take care, everybody. Thanks a lot.